Hi, I'm Joel from Coaches Rising, and this dialogue was recorded as part of The Power of Embodied Transformation 2016. For more information, you can visit www.powerofembodiedtransformation.com. So in this dialogue, I'm talking with Richard Strozzi Heckler. He's a true pioneer in the field of somatic coaching, and he's been in this field for decades. He's the author of several classic books on the topic and works with people like NATO, the US government and Marine Corps, many Fortune 500 companies and NGOs. So, enjoy. So, yeah, great to have you with us today, Richard. And, um, you know, it's nice to see you face to face. We've spoke quite a few times now, but it's always been on the telephone. So, um, yeah, really nice to have this face to face connection, particularly because we're going to be talking today about uh, you know, somatic coaching and leadership and embodied change. So welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you too, Joel. Great. Um, I'm going to talk about a few different topics today, but I want to begin by asking you where this work came from. I know you've uh, been working for many decades now in, in developing your work. And I was just curious if you could share maybe a story or two about how this work came into the world. I think maybe a good place to start would be um, for me to remember that I, I really come from the tradition of the bodily arts. Um, I started um, uh, martial arts when I was between my 12th and 13th year, and uh, I also went to uh, university, undergraduate school, on an athletic scholarship. And so this whole notion of um, using the body uh, in different ways and using it competitively, using the body in uh, coordination with other people in the martial arts uh, has has long informed has long informed me. And in those traditions too, I, I I learned the importance of having a good teacher, just immeasurable to have good teachers. And when you say where this work has come from, I've really had um, uh, many many superlative teachers that I have great. Um, uh, acknowledgement to and gratefulness towards that that have shaped me both specifically in somatics and 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 cultivated as a person too and uh, so the the this notion of learning through the body and and, and um, uh, cultivating the self through the body started with early with the martial arts and I still do martial arts I still train and teach Aikido and I've done a number of martial arts. I was, you know, ranked, it started with ju ju Judo, Jiu Jitsu, Karate and in the Marine Corps I taught hand-to-hand -hand combat and then I found Aikido in my um, uh, late 20s and that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, the, one of the things that this, this embodied life has taught me through martial arts early on and sports is that um, number one, the value of having a great teacher. And number two is that there, there's really no replacement for practice. Mm -hmm. That if we want to change or shift or modify or transform ourselves, we have to engage in some kind of a practice. And also, the, um, uh, uh, it revealed to me really the joy of learning in a collective or in a community. Um, you know, that uh, training with a group of people or, or, or practicing with a group of people and the kind of friendships that you develop there and how you learn not only from the teacher but this other people in the, in the dojo or the community is very, very strong. And then uh, very early on I, I studied um, rolfing with Robert Hall. Uh, um, I spent some time with Moshe Feldenkrais. I apprenticed with a man named Randolph Stone, who was the founder of Polarity Therapy. Um, I worked with a number of students of Wilhelm Reich, uh, Doris Breyer, Magda Proskauer. And uh, these people all had um, great impact upon me. And um, they're, except for one of them, they're all gone now. And um, I've also been in a uh, meditation practice since uh, the late 60s actually 68, 69, and I do a, a, a daily meditation practice. I, we teach that in our courses at Strozzi Institute. Um, you know, when, when we first started introducing uh, meditation uh, to the organizational teams or departments we work with, 
um, they always, I could see they had this visualization of somebody with a white beard and these long robes or the Beatles or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was always a big enough speed bump to go, and we're going to engage with our body, so let's all stand up. That was, you know, 30 years ago, a big grab. Uh, then to mention meditation, it was a whole other piece. So we started to call it attention training. Mm -hmm. And um, so that people who are successful and fulfilled are able to center inside their attention, their, their mind, so to speak, doesn't run away with them. Mm. So um, that also is a, a very strong influence in my teacher there, uh, Charan Singh. Maharaj Charan Singh has been very influential where I, I spent, I think, three different trips with him in India, and lived there and trained. So... Um, the influences really are uh, having exemplary, uh, 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 gracious, generous teachers. They were also firm. They were also very firm with me. Um, also the importance of, of knowing practices. And then I had this natural bent just from growing up that uh, I could uh, bring my body or my soma and instead of just having a good idea about something, I could actually embody that idea, which seemed to me very, 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 very early, very crucial. Um, you know, once uh, I, I, I was living in Japan studying the martial arts, and the Western community would come together, and after the training, and we would talk, and this was pretty much young men, testosterone-driven, and often the conversation would go, okay, well, I could do this, or I could do that, and and uh, we realized it was always like, at that moment, go, well, let's see. So it wasn't just the idea, but a young man from New Guinea who was actually studying in Oxford said, um, uh, you know, my country, we have this proverb, and the proverb says that knowledge is only a rumor until it's in the muscle. Mm. So that hit me like, boom. That was like, wow. Knowledge is only a rumor until it's in the muscle. And really what I was pointing to is a, 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 a an elementary factor in somatics, which is that um, uh, we can have these insights, we can have these revelations, we can gather this data and this knowledge. And what does it mean to actually be that? So we're not just speaking good ideas or talking about the insights, but we take actions that we couldn't take previous to that. Mm beautiful to hear about all that I, I do want to go on a into a more micro level about you know how do you actually begin to uh, work with our soma in this way but I know that you worked with the US Army Special Services and you've you know throughout the years been working uh, with the army I just wondered if you could talk about how that impacted the work and, and what did you teach them and you know how was embodiment present there yes um, this work began in the mid 80s and um, I was approached by a, um, a group of people in military who said that they were looking for a holistic soldier. So I know that for many people that sounds like an oxymoron, but it was in the America, it was kind of recovering from uh, the, the debacle of Vietnam and what had happened there and how do we reconstitute the, the modern military inside in, in a new paradigm. And who we were approached by were the Army Special Forces as the, the, the Green Berets. And we did a six month classified project with them um, so that, as they said, we could build uh, uh, physical enhancements, mental enhancements, and team cohesion. And in this program, we introduced meditation. We did meditation every day. We did um, uh, 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 Aikido every day. We redesigned their diet. We redesigned their physical training program. Uh, uh, we produced different ways of how they communicate with each other. And um, we actually work with their, their, their families and their, their spouses as, as well. And in this six month program, which was 24 seven, we just were just deeply, deeply inside of um, uh, their work and everything that they did, we did too, you know. And uh, the results just went off the charts. Uh, they just improved in all these different areas. And um, at, when they went back to their post, they, everybody said they were better leaders. 
And that was not the promise of the course. It was physical enhancements, mental enhancements, and team cohesion. So probably most of your listeners here will go, that would obviously make a good leader. But it wasn't the promise. Uh, but I thought, oh, what we're doing here with them. And at that time, I was a, a practicing uh, body psychotherapist with a huge individual practice. Uh, I did groups and I also trained others. Um, that we could bring this into a wider population. Uh, we could bring this into government. We could bring this into business, etc. cetera. And um, that led to, um, I kept a journal during that project. And when the project was declassified, a uh, publisher, my publisher said, would you like to make a book and a book out of that? And that's what's called In Search of the Warrior Spirit. Mm. And I think it's in its fourth edition now. Um, it came out in the early 90s and it went all the way through um, the, the, the last decade where I spent time also in uh, three, three times in Afghanistan during that conflict as well as uh, once in Iraq. And that piece of work in the book led me to do work with the uh, Navy SEALs, the uh, Air Force Pararescue Jumpers, in other words, all the spe Special Operations Command. Uh, Marines, Marine Reconnaissance. Um, that led to a program that the Commandant of the Marine Corps asked me to um, build a leadership program for the, the uh, Marine Corps. And it was built inside of the context of martial arts. It's called the Marine Corps Martial Art Program, MCMAP. And it was a um, brilliant vision that he had, you know, um, and what he, he used to be, the sergeant would take over the, the, the C box and put his knee up and call everybody around and kind of give a leadership lecture. And what we did is designed a program that leadership principles were taught through the martial arts and that so that then they would become embodied. Mm -hmm. People would really know what it meant to be centered, what it really meant to be able to be a deeper listener to somebody else. And, um, you know, for most young men and women, martial arts are sexy. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, oh, another classroom thing. It was like, I'll actually learn these techniques. Mm -hmm. And um, in part of our, our data, what we, we saw, we also taught them meditation um, uh, uh, and uh, aspects for different kinds of healing. But what we saw is that the domestic violence went down, uh, drug alcohol abuse went down, and fights uh, went down. Um, and so that was a big eye opener too for me and maybe for your listeners, it would make sense the way that we taught it, that that would happen. But it was a very, very powerful moment to go, oh, mm -hmm. teaching in this way is actually a way to build a different kind of citizen. And in general Jones, he said, that's what he wants. He said, you know, there's only out of every 10 people that come into the Marines, only 30% will stay. Seven go back out, and how can we make them more solid citizens? Mm -hmm. You know, so that they're more self-generating, self-educating, self-healing. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I still do um, uh, uh, advising and consultation where I choose with certain kinds of branches, and have kept up a lot of um, uh, contacts throughout these years. Because. Mm -hmm. Could you go into on, on this more granular level? What what was changing with those soldiers? Like in the moment, something was changing, and and how do we translate that into you know like leaders and just people in their general lives? Maybe you could speak about that. Yes. Well, the um, an interesting thing about this program was that we asked that these people um, that when we first went in, like in the Trojan Warrior Project, we had twenty five Green Berets under operational command. And we said, we want them all to be volunteers, know exactly what the program is going to be like, because it's going to be so totally different than what they're used to. And um, some of them became military volunteers, which is, if you don't do this, uh, you'll probably end up in motor pool. Mm -hmm. So they kind of shaped themselves to do it. But basically what I'm saying is that we had resistors. And what I want to tell you is that because they were in the military, they might have been resisting internally, but they did the, they did the practices. Mm. They did the practices. So a third of them were like, wow, you are my dream come true. I've been waiting forever to learn these things. Middle third were like, let's wait and see. And a bottom third were you're like my worst nightmare. 
I'm a Green Beret and you're this guy coming and you're going to teach these things that are real soft skills. But even them, they changed. And uh, what they began to learn by working through the body in this way, with this narrative and these practices, are a couple of things. Is that how do you actually build trust with somebody? And what kind of a presence do you need that actually builds trust? So you go out into the, 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 the hinterland of Afghanistan, you meet the tribal elder, and really what they're looking for is, um, as one told me, he said, we're looking for the air, what we might call the, 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 the aura or the presence of somebody. That's what speaks the loudest, not what they're saying, but their air. And so we taught them what it means to build trust as a presence so that you're both open uh, and present, but you're also connected to your own values. And actually, how does that live in your body? It's what we call a leadership presence. How do you face into difficult situations without it having to end up in um, aggressiveness or, or violence? How do you become a bigger and stronger listener to the concerns of other people? And um, how can you enter in in a particular way in what we call blend with or deeply collaborate with somebody else so that they, they go, oh, they, they get me. We, we may disagree, but they get me and we're going to have to work together. So let's find that place where we can tie in what we call in uh, Aikido, Masubi, that where we tie in with each other and can move and we can move forward. Mm. Um, and so these are really very similar things that we teach at Strozzi Institute when we teach in business. It's what we teach in our, our coaching curriculum. And um, uh, the, the power of it, obviously from my point of view, is that these uh, distinctions and these principles and values become embodied. It's just not I can talk about these good things that I actually become a different kind of actor in the world. So, you know, the practices, we did body work with them. We did meditation, what we might call mindfulness. You know, I, I, from that, I helped inter introduce meditation into a number of the different branches and started a meditation group at the Pentagon that's still going. And now that mindfulness is on the cover of Time Magazine and Scientific America, it's, it's more digestible for people, you know. Mm. In fact, it's it's becoming almost a, trend, a fad and a trend. So it's really working with them in, in that kind of way. We say we want to uh, uh, in, have you interpret your body not just as this thing that carries you around so that you can perform, but it has its own level of wisdom, intelligence, and um, uh, compassion that uh, we can bring forward. And in order to build these other skills too, we want to be able to, to make sure that they're embedded inside of our tissues so it becomes who we are. Because mm. what comes up as you speak about this, I, what I love, one of the things I love about your work is this, um, uh, the arc of somatic transformation. And I think that's a really good way for people to get a, a kind of sense of this, uh, this journey that people can go through once they start working through the body and you know and i love the way you talk about how the body here is not just you know our physical body but it's this kind of life force and and shaping and conditioning and so could you talk a little bit about maybe this arc of transformation and how that what that journey looks like yes um what we've seen over time is that there's a there's a theme or a pattern where a person moves from what we call the current or historical shape. In other words, we, can, we, we would posit that the, the, the body is the shape of our experience. It holds all of our history. It holds all of our concerns. It holds our wounds. It holds our healing. It holds our thrust for the best possible future. It holds how we make and execute on commitments and how we don't. In other words, we can train ourselves to look at a shape that somebody's in and say, oh, this is really where they're strong. And this is where they might be less strong or it might be a liability for them. So um, uh, in the very beginning of this arc of transformation, we start with the, the current or the historical shape. And inevitably in coaching, somebody says, here I am at A and what I want to do is I want to move to B. That may be very specific. I'm a, uh, a computer scientist 
Mostly I work alone. Now I'm in this position, I have to lead a team. I don't know what those skills are. I don't know how to be inside of that. It could also be as general as somebody says, I've reached a certain place in my life. My kids are grown. I've ended this job. I have a yearning for something else and I don't know what's next. So the B could be less defined, but it always comes down to a, an expression of how do I navigate from this self, this being, to another self or another being or another shape. So we always say the person has the authority, they embody the authority to make these choices. And our work is that uh, inside of this new shape, there's a new self, which is our claim is the body and the self, how we define the self, are deeply interlinked. Um, so inside of this current shape, we ask people to form a commitment. What's their commitment? We introduce the notion of uh, we negotiate practices, how much we're going to work. Um, we begin to give assessments and we can say, here's in your shape what may keep you from holding you back from this next uh, step. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this computer scientist who's so uh, very brilliant at, at doing his work and being in front of a computer is that um, when he faces another human being, he doesn't have the skill of going, oh, this other human being has a whole new set of um, concerns and I just can't press A and A is going to come up. I have to be able to collaborate with them. And so if that person's head is real forward and their eyes are darting back and forth and they're just listening uh, at, 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 as a way to listen to when they stop so I can begin talking, we'd say you're not going to build trust that way. So you might want to bring your head back, practice making a steady uh, but uh, focused gaze with somebody and start listening to concerns. So it's like, how do we then begin to move this shape into this other shape that we can allow this person to move towards uh, this desired future that they're looking for? Mm. And once this shape begins to become begins to change or begins to modify or be dismantled or de-armored, we'll call it, is that they open into what we call as an unbounded uh, shape. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, in this project I was telling you about with the Green Berets, there was one young soldier that after we did our PT in the morning, did our yoga and our stretching, he had this kind of worried look on his face. And I came over to him and I said, so, Sergeant Dibel, here's what, what, what's up with you? And they were all, you know, um, le all lean towards Machi. I'm fine. Everything's good. I dug in a little bit deeper and he goes, you know, he said, you know those migraine headaches I told you about? Mm -hmm. He says, ever since I've been doing this work with you all, those are gone. I don't have them anymore. And um, I said, well, that's terrific. What, what's, what's the concern? What are you worried about? And he said, well, you know, when you tell me to stand this way in this kind of manner and, and to release my jaw and how to breathe more effectively, I don't feel like a green beret anymore. And it was just a poignant moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, what does a green beret feel like? And then he straightened his body and he pulled in his chin and brought his shoulders back and his chin. He stuck his chest out and his breath was high and his jaw was tight and he goes, eyes were taut and he said, like this. And so I tell that story because basically he was moving into the unbounded space. And so when we begin to change our shape, uh, uh, it's not uncommon that the question comes up, either, either in bold highlight or very subtly, is uh, who am I or who am I now? Um, uh, what I seem to care about or what mattered to me uh, matters less now. And something else is starting to come to shape. This is the evolutionary process. We see this in all life. You know, the dream of every cell is to become two, is to divide and become two. So we grow, we become more complex, we have more choice for ourselves. Um, so in this, there's this unbounded space. And in this unbounded space, What's often useful there is we work on, we actually work on the body. We work on the tissues so that the armoring begins to dissolve. Uh, the old pat they become much more aware of their new, their new patterns. 
Um, I mean, they're old patterns. They begin to see this possibility of, oh, I'm, I'm actually, I am actually changing now. Not only do I feel that here, but I'm getting that reflection from the outside. Um, that can also be a difficult time because people will go, wow, I don't, I now forget where I came from and I can't see where I'm going, just like a ship crossing a great gulf. Mm. And um, there's this moment of like, those structures or boundaries of how I knew myself, I don't have those anymore. So really the skill of the somatic coach then is how to navigate, how to help midwife or shepherd that person through that open space. And then um, inside of that, uh, often people will go, you know, I started with this commitment, but now that I'm more deeply inside of myself, I begin to see that that actually isn't what it is. I inherited that commitment. Like that's what I should do. I inherited by the social forces, how I was raised, the institutions, um, the social norms, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually a new commitment. And so uh, it's like a, a, a large matrix or a hologram you go back to right at the beginning. And we're in this shape now making a new commitment, new practices, new relationships with others. Mm. The third large bucket is then what begins to happen is this new shape begins to take form. And what people see is that, oh, I can see that shore or I can see that lighthouse. I can start to move towards that. And as I do, the feedback that I get from the world is very affirming and confirming. And it's telling me that um, the, the way that I'm behaving now as a leader, as a partner, uh, uh, as an as a individual, um, is, uh, as a person as part of a community or a collective, is now starting to show up. And it's showing up in a way that some people will go, wow, I don't know. You know, we used to always have a drink every night at five o'clock or two drinks. And now you don't do that with me anymore. So I don't know what to do with you. Other people will go, I really like this new shape. You are much more contactable. You're much more uh, transparent. You're much more authentic. And there's a very strong, deep ground in you. So that confirmation begins to happen. And then the fourth large bucket is what we call embodying that new shape. So often when people start to see this new shape, they'll go, oh, that's it. And they'll just move ahead and then uh, uh, not look at what are the practices now that I need to actually embody this new shape and what might be the rough patches on the road that I can start to anticipate with others, with my work, with my personal relationships inside of this new shape. Mm. And um, that's kind of a general overview of what I would call this, uh, the arc of uh, somatic transformation, that we're moving from one self, one shape, and we're, we're beginning to grow, evolve into a new shape, into a new self. I, I love this way of working. And I think for me, um, it was like I had this... You know, I would often talk about change, and and there was a point in my own coaching where I would I would talk to my clients, and we would we would have, uh, you know, powerful conversations. But um, I struggled with really helping people to to make these kind of embodied shifts. And it was only when I started to encounter this kind of work where it was like, oh, this is the how. You know, this is actually how you can actually begin to start entering into these new shapes and embodying them, which result in totally uh, different responses from people or, you know, uh, you know, getting new kinds of work or new relationships or different kinds of successes. And so that's what really stands out for me is, is that it, it's really practical, this kind of way of working as well. The uh, often I think that uh, at least in, in Western philosophy that at the time of Galileo, Copernicus, that group of, of thinkers, the astronomers, the early physicists, their question is, where are we? Where, where are we in the universe? You know, and one of the things we, uh, that was declared was that, oh, we're not at the center of the universe. We're some, we're at a different location. And then really at the time with, uh, in the West with Freud, uh, in that group of thinkers, often the question was, why are we? Why, why do we enact these things in these particular ways? And um, 
Now I believe that we're really in a time of how are we? And how are we, for example, how are we polluting our waters? How are we staining uh, uh, the air that we have? And by looking at these things, we can then begin to go, this is how we need to shift it then. How is ha has to do with our actual behaviors and how do we bring a, a new muscular commitment to actions that we bring in more, more life-affirming world. So it's a, I, I agree with you there very much that this notion of how is essential. Mm. Could you share with us, uh, like the practice of centering, you know, like to, to give us an experience of that, um, you know, we've been talking about the importance of practice and I imagine there's so many layers of nuance to how you can construct a, a practice, but maybe you could share with us now a, a centering practice that we can try. Good. And, um, as I share this, let's all, let's all do this. You can do this with me. Mm. Um, and first of all, I want to say, you know, everybody, everybody think being centered is a good idea. Um, just like everybody thinks pe world peace is a good idea, but we don't have that. So when we talk about being centered, we we're saying there's actually something that you can do here. And, um, I'll go through this with you. Uh, we, we could go through this and take a half an hour to do it. I'll go through it with you a little bit quicker than that. But we work with four basic dimensions, and these four basic dimensions are uh, uh, inside of every living thing, all the way from, let's say, a hippopotamus to a human being to a cell to the rhododendrons in your garden. And that's length. Things have length, things have width, and things have depth. And inside of that, there's an organizing principle for that life. So when we center, uh, we can start with length. And we are the only animal that can be in length. We're, on, we're the two-legged animal uh, that frees our hands, that gives us ability to look further out. When we stand, we know that begins to shift our brain and bring forward language. And we are, are exposing our heart, our stomach, and our pelvis to the world. We're really facing into the world. So what we can do here is we can align our head, our shoulders, our hips. If you're sitting, it would be your hips here. If you're standing, it would be your knees and then your feet. And what we're doing when we're uh, in this alignment and relaxing in this alignment is that we were, are coming into harmony with the energy field of the planet. That's a, that's a huge huge ally for us and it's a huge declaration and the the energy field of the planet is um, gravity mm -hmm. yeah and gravity is 24 7 you wake up in the middle of the night at three and um, you put your arm out and don't try to hold it up it'll fall or you take a ball and you throw it up it'll fall so gravity is always happening and if we make friends with gravity we're able to be able to relax aspects of our mus musculature that allow us to organize that energy into different actions. So along length, for example, we want to say, let's relax our eyes. Mm. And that means that this whole band here, we begin to relax them. I think you've all had the experience. You can look in somebody's eyes and uh, you go, oh, they're not here or they're frozen or they seem alarmed. Or they're shocked. There are people who have severe PTSD that their eyes are already in, uh, are consistently held in that shock position. Mm. Relaxing the eyes, we relax the brain because the eyes and brain are connected through the optic nerve. We we make a space between our teeth. Systems designed so the teeth never have to touch. Jaw and the chin are relaxed. We think of our shoulders and coat hangers are just dropped and we let our breath drop to our abdomen. The design is that breath is, is low. It's a diaphragm, a diaphragmic uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that word, but it's in the diaphragm. Yeah. <laughs> and that the system is designed that the mass of the body, the muscular system is held in the bones. 
So you think, can I let my muscles relax into my bones? Mm. So I'm both straightening and settling at the same time along length. Somatically, we call that, we become the bridge between heaven and earth. We, our feet are on the ground and we have a moral spiritual vision. Mm. Then we balance left and right. You can feel that in your sit bones, in your feet. If you kind of want to wiggle in there and do like this, you can. Uh, if the head's this way, we bring it straight this way. Again, we're, 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 we're beginning to come into harmony with the, the field of gravity. Uh, and uh, when we breathe, we not only feel our breath going up and down long length, we feel it expanding our ribcage this way, almost like a clamshell opening this way. And uh, we begin to feel our edges along the sides of our bodies. And we begin to feel, oh, what are the boundaries that I have in the social plane? So in somatics, we say width is the social plane. This is where we connect with people. This is where we let people in. This is where we say to other people, uh, that's close enough. We don't want to go any further here. Um, that's the place where we can actually extend to loved ones that aren't even in our physical presence. We can extend to those loved ones that are even continents away. Uh, and uh, so width uh, is that we are connecting to others and to the environment. Third, we go to depth, front and back. So many senses in front. In the West, we're really geared towards rationalistic thinking, to be on handheld devices, to be in computers. We'll find this shape. And when we're in this shape, all those muscles along the back are in contraction so we don't tip forward. So we feel a balance between our front and back. Uh, we're in touch with our back body, uh, what has come before us, our teachers, our parents, those that have influenced us. So we have this relationship between our front and back. And everybody try this for a minute. Just at a little bit, just come back on your heels or just go back. Like, I'm going to move away from the world. I'm going to, to enact my own reluctance. I'm going to enact my own stubbornness. I'm going to say no without saying no. And now let yourself tip into the world. Gee, what's the next fad? Uh, what, what's the next trend? Um, how can I move into somebody so they might like me? I'll forget myself and try to get closer to them this way. And then come back so you feel that balance between front and back. You're not falling back, you're not moving forward. So that's depth. Also in depth, we say depth is, we, we listen to that depth inside of ourself, somatic self, and we listen to what now wants to come to form, what now wants to come to shape. So if we're reflective, um, uh, uh, purposeful people, what we'll always be listening to is, um, how can I enact my purpose, my destiny, if you will, my karma, my path, my trajectory, mm. my trajectory into the world? Mm. And then if you take your fingers like this, mm. you put them about two inches below your belly button and just kind of press in. I say press in about two inches below, a little bit lower on women because of the structural makeup of the pelvis, is that... Um, that's the center of these three dimensions. Mm. So move your hand away, but keep your attention dropped there. So that's the organizing principle of these three dimensions. Is there a heart center? Absolutely. A throat center? Absolutely. An eye center? Absolutely. But if we start with uh, the, the belly center, uh, what the Japanese called hara, or tanden or tantian in Chinese, Sufis call it koth, the belly center. This is the center of action or the center of will where we have a dropped open attention. Mm -hmm. So um, what we claim is you take some time every day to do this. Uh, um, and if you do it consciously as a way to build this as a pathway for you to always come back to the present moment, to be connected to what you care about and to be open to possibility, it'll become embodied. It'll start to become who you are and how you are. Mm. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. 
So, um, because I want to explore now, you're going to be one of the key faculty on the upcoming program, uh, the empower, the power of embodied transformation. And um, I wonder if you could share a little bit what you're going to be teaching. You're going to lead four sessions in that, and perhaps you could just give us a, a quick uh, kind of digest of of what people are going to get in those four sessions. Yeah, the first session is going to be what. Uh, we call the sites of shaping sites of change. Mm. Um, and this is how um, historical forces, institutional forces, um, uh, our communities, uh, our nations, even our race, um, our, 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 our gender, um, uh, our class, all influence who we are. Uh, uh, most coaching has to do with the influences of the primary influences of family, mother and father, and maybe community. And um, we see it's essential that we look beyond that and see that because some people go, I'm just this kind of person for my parent, as opposed to, oh, because of my class and my race and my color, these historical forces shape me mm. in a particular way. And by shaped in that particular way, <clears throat> Um, there's things that I, as a coach, need to know about myself because of ways that I'll bring my own uh, uh, optic into things and my own prejudice. But also I will um, need to see other people in that particular way as well. Um, that will be the first session. Um, the second session, I'm going to go into more depth around the um, uh, arc of somatic transformation and what it means and how we can look there and what, what occurs inside of that and what are the caveats we need to look at and um, we'll have some exercises to do around there. In the third session we'll go into more depth in the unbounded or the open space, this place where we've left one shore and then we haven't yet received the, I mean, uh, uh, come upon the other shore. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about the new shape. And when people are in the new shape, what new practices are required there? How, do one, how does one begin to look at that? And how do we begin to fully embody this new self we are as we are in all these sites of change too, with our clients, um, uh, with our partners, um, in the historical moment that we're in, in our institutions, etc. cetera. I, it, it'll be a very, very rich rich time and the um it's always very uh stimulating to me of the 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 questions that the coaches have in the coaches rising program and what they bring forward into it and that 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 you know the questions that come in might be questions that 20 other people would have but didn't ask so mm -hmm. it's always very rich for everybody mm -hmm. and um, i'm also looking for uh space inside of it that uh i could um do a little bit of a uh, mini session coaching session with people also mm. Mm. beautiful well i can't wait for that and um well, I, you know feels like a good place to close and i want to thank you uh for sharing today and um yeah i just love hearing these stories about how your work's being shaped and influenced over the years and just really great to see you face to face you know to have this uh more embodied connection, it feels like. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. yeah, I'm touched by that. I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, very yeah, pleased today. So, thank you, Richard. I know you've got to yes, shoot Joel. off now. And before I forget, let me say, uh, I just spoke to Stacy this morning. She wanted yeah. to send on her regards to you and Lawrence also. Oh, beautiful. Great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All okay. Right. Take you care. Yeah. See you soon. See Bye. you. Hi, Joel here again, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you're curious about going deeper into all the topics we talked about, then I encourage you to take a look at our coach training. During the training, Richard 
Mandy Blake, Doug Sealsby and Peter Meal will teach you how to facilitate embodied transformation with your clients. You'll grow your capacity to see your clients' conditioned, habituated patterns as they arise and you'll learn how to help them disrupt these patterns and shift into new, more empowered and creative ways of being. Learning this stuff was really the missing key for me in my own coaching and it gave me this confidence I could really help my clients. So if you like the sound of this, You'll find out more details at www.powerofembodiedtransformation.com.